and this will allow people to start coming into the room. Mm -hmm. <coughs> So, and as people start coming in, um, good morning, everybody. I'm Franklin Escovito. I'm the Community Services Director here for the Larkspur Library. Um, thank you for joining us this morning. And people are slowly coming into the room. Um, we will be sending out some handouts in the chat. Um, but today we want to remind people to use the Q&A um, to ask your questions. And we'll be taking questions at the very end of the lecture. So, um, again, welcome. Good morning. <laughs> um, you know, I'm like s s jumping through here. Um, we're still working on more garden talks that will be starting soon. We, we had a little slowdown, but we're hoping to get it uh, up and going towards the end of the month. Um, today we're here um, with Dana, um, Dana and Janice from the UC Master Gardeners. Um, so, and it's not quite 11 yet. So as people start coming in, this was a sold out um, crowd. So um, more than the room could hold. <laughs> So should we introduce ourselves yet? Or just well, no, not, yeah, give it go a, a couple more minutes. This is when I ever okay. come in. And then um, as people are saying hello, I mean, Happy New Year's. Happy New Year's, everybody. Um, for those of you who are wondering what happened to the library, um, we've had um, some illnesses. Um, we had a COVID scare. So we've been at um, reduced capacity for the last couple of weeks. So we hopefully will get everything up and going again for curbside next week. Um, and we're hoping to get everything flowing again. So we have been putting some stuff outside um, that had been called for prior to us all getting sick. Um, but we're almost back to normal and we're almost 100%. Um, <coughs> here I'm a little congested. I caught a cold this week. Um, so I've been out and my children's librarian, Teresa, had also been out. So um, we left Anna all by herself, which is why we had to close the library because um, really one person can't run everything answer all the phones and run outside to put out bags for everybody. So we wanna thank everybody for your patience, but we're hoping to, like I said, to get back to normal next week. Um, again, thank you for joining us this morning and hopefully everybody can see the, <laughs> the slideshow. And um, don't forget to follow us on our Instagram, our Twitter and our Facebook. You can find out all sorts of stuff, um, programs, events, things that are going on. Um, if for some reason you get bumped off today's event, we are recording it um, and it will be posted to the library's YouTube channel. Um, you can always go back and watch our other garden talks. We have a lot of them that we've done last year and we'll, we'll be continuing to add them this year as well. It's a wonderful resource, I have to say, having that YouTube channel. Yeah, no, we've, we've gotten a lot of use out of it. We've had it for a while, but we actually, now that COVID happened, we're really starting to utilize it and to record our programs. Um, and especially because sometimes they're at odd times during the day, like our author talks are usually at two in the afternoon where everybody's at work again. Mm -hmm. um, but they're, they're recorded, so you can always, you know, catch up and watch um, and see what happens. So, um, so we have forty-one people. Yeah, so far. That's so fine. here, let me um, stop my share. And again, I'm Franklin Escobedo. I'm the Community Services Director here at the Larkspur Library. I'm, I'm from my home today. But today um, we're here with um, Janice Rosales and Dana uh, Tamura from the UC Master Gardeners who will be talking about, um, I guess, how do you say it? Es Espalier. Es Espalier. So I'm Espalier. gonna hand it over to them. So thanks for joining us, everybody. And I'll be here in the background if you need me. Okay. okay. Well, good morning. Welcome to our workshop on Espalier Basics. Dana Tamura and I, Janice Rosales, are UC Marin Master Gardeners and are members of the Marin Master Gardeners Pruning Guild since 2017. <clears throat> Dana has taken our PowerPoint and made it a video. So we will go straight through our presentation and take questions at the end. There'll be plenty of time for questions. There are some helpful handouts in the chat section for you to review. The PowerPoint will also be available on Larkspur Library's YouTube channel if you wanna see the presentation again. Should you have a question, please click on the questions and answers button at the bottom of your screen and write your questions there. Thank you to the Larkspur Library and our host Community Services Director, Franklin Escobedo, for giving us this opportunity to share our presentation. Thank you for attending our workshop. And now Dana, take it away. Hi. 
I am uh, Dana Tamura, and I have to say that I think that the four pages that we were going to send you as resources are probably not going to come through the chat function because I seem to be unable to do that in this format. I, I got Frank, two of them up right now. <laughs> right, so Franklin will be sending it to you. So everybody will get those. And they're basically just some of the pages we thought might be useful as resources after the fact, after we're all finished. So without further ado, let me take you to our program. Welcome fellow plant people. Janice and I, and this is Dana speaking now, are Marin Master Gardeners, which is a volunteer program offered through the University of California Cooperative Extension. The purpose of Master Gardeners is to provide the public with education and information regarding how to incorporate appropriate horticulture techniques while working with plants, the soil, and irrigation in your gardens. So what is espalier and why and how would we use it? Well, we consider it an art form amongst other things. You can grow beautiful sculptured plants that will fit into a much smaller space. Industry uses it on a large scale and considers espalier to be an economical form of growing more fruit in less space with more ease and dealing with pests, diseases, and harvesting. We'll be covering the different patterns traditional to espalier, the pros and cons of espalier, how to manage actually growing, training, and pruning espalier fruit trees. Shown here are a few examples from the River Road Farms in Tennessee that specializes in espalier fruit trees. Espalier is the ancient, beginning with the Romans and refined by Europe in the 1500s, an all but forgotten art of training fruit and ornamental trees to grow flat against a wall, fence, archway, or other two-dimensional surface, creating a living sculpture. Here are a couple of examples. This crisscross style is called a Belgian fence pattern. It can be used to create a living fence, as you see in the image on the right behind the blue bench, or as a decoration for a wall, as you see on the left. The image on the left shows a cordon style espalier against a wall. Think long cord. The image on the right is a three-tier palmette verrier style. Both are very traditional espalier patterns. Espaliered apple trees were used here to make a living tunnel or entry archway. And here, and in the next photo, you can see espalier in use as a living fence. Again, you see both the Belgian fence style in use here. And here you see the candelabra style, which is very similar to the palmette verrier style you saw earlier. All three styles make a very interesting living fence and are used here and there. Espalier is used quite often to decorate buildings while saving space and hopefully creating a mini orchard at the same time. This style is a natural fan shape, which is one of the easiest espalier patterns to create. And this building is being decorated using the candelabra pattern. And espalier is used to make beautiful spaces. This particular space happens to be a wedding venue. Those of you that live in California will recognize this.
Now, we're not recommending this particular treatment of plants, but these are interesting. These trees were shaped by Axel Erlinson sometime in the mid 1940s. In 1985, they were moved to the Gilroy Gardens where you can still see them. As you can see here, an espalier plant has a narrow canopy. Note how the sun is able to pen really penetrate the plant and gets into the branches, shines on all the leaves and all the fruit quite easily with greater sun coverage. They're a great decorative addition to a garden with limited space, as you can squeeze quite a few of them in since they don't take up much room. They can hide less than attractive walls or fences. There's an ease in managing their growth and structure and in harvesting the fruit. You can grow several cultivars on one plant if you're interested in grafting. Heat from the walls radiate back into the plant during the winter, providing more heat and frost protection is particularly helpful with uh, citrus plants. It's easier to see and manage pests. And of course, you can feed your garden artistry urge to your heart's content. They can keep you quite busy. It's much easier to protect against pests on a uh, espalier plant because it's just easier to get into the plant itself. Um, the fruit is easier to find and remove, and if you need to, there's better spray coverage. Uh, should you want to use horticultural oil to, during the dormant season. The fruit may be easier to protect and keep dry because you can throw a piece of plastic or netting over the very thin canopy of the, fruit, of the plant, and it works pretty well. There are a number of pests that can attack your fruit trees, including the codling moth and the citrus psyllid shown here. Horticulture oil, when mixed with water and sprayed on trees during the dormant season, will smother overwintering insects and their eggs. It targets mites, aphids, codling moth, leafhoppers, mealybugs, leaf miners, and more. This is one of many techniques that can be used as a control. Beneficial insects are rarely around trees in the dormant season, so if you must spray, the dormant season is the time to do it. You can see how harvesting and checking for pest damage might be a bit easier on an espalier fruiting plant. You can reach right in and eliminate some pests by hand. It's also easier to get any spray into the interior of the plants if need be. And when it comes time to harvest, the fruit is unobstructed and within reach. There is a wealth of information about management of plant diseases at your local Master Gardener's website. Here are a couple of common problems and suggested fixes. Peach leaf curl can be managed with lime sulfur, a fungicide that controls fungal diseases like apple and pear scab, and peach leaf curl. Copper is a fungicide and bactericide that helps control diseases like bacterial canker and fire blight. You can get fairly good spray coverage with these mixes on an espalier plant during the winter months. Two of the many reasons espalier helps with pest management are shown here. It's relatively easy to cover an espalier plant with a plastic tarp for a period of time or to cover with netting while a particular pest is active. To protect against brown rot and peach leaf curl, for example, tarping just before heavy rains can help with these problems. And netting can be used to protect against birds, squirrels, rodents, and such. There are a few disadvantages to espalier training and growing. As you've seen from some of the images, espalier plants have a narrower canopy, which is great for getting sunlight in, but can also cause sunburn and borers in the burnt areas of the plant. There's a learning curve to creating an espalier tree or shrub, which can be really interesting and a bit challenging initially. It requires increased management in spring and midsummer when there is some necessary pruning involved, 
And not all species or varieties work well with espalier. Some are so vigorous that it's impossible to keep them in check and they're better left to grow in their own natural forms. Some fruit species don't work as well with espalier because they fruit on new wood only. More on this to come. Before we move on, let me give you a refresher on some of the popular styles of espalier because I'll be referring to them later. On the upper left is the horizontal cordon style. The upper right is palmette verrier, which is sometimes confused with candelabra, which is in the middle. On the lower left, you see the informal fan shape, which is the easiest to create. And on the right is the Belgian fence. One of the most common choices for espalier are apple tree varieties, as apple trees tend to be relatively easy to train. They're used for a number of different patterns. Horizontal espalier, the cordon style, is the easiest, but fan, palmetto, candelabra, or Belgian fence are also popular. Pears are much like apples and treated similarly because both pear and apple trees fruit on spurs along the branches rather than on branch tips, which we'll show examples of later. Citrus fruit trees like orange, lemon, kumquat, or pomelo can be done, but espalier citrus trees tend to prefer more informal designs. They do well as a horizontal but natural or fan shapes are a much easier form in which to train citrus. Plums and apricots both seem to do best as a fan shape, but can be trained into a low horizontal hedge as well. Both of these need more attention than some other varieties as they tend to send off lots of young shoots, which means more frequent pruning. Espalier pomegranate trees do quite well in natural espalier form rather than formal, which means they're trained against a flat surface, but not in any particular pattern, as do some varieties of persimmon. Peaches and nectarines only produce fruit on new wood, which means that they're going to require a lot more pruning to encourage flushes of new growth. These should be pruned in an informal fan shape to provide room for the young fruiting branches to grow. Espalier fig trees are also popular for the horizontal method, although as fig trees become quite large, they're more commonly trained to an informal fan pattern, which is a little bit easier to do. I skipped over this. I mentioned in the last slide that apple trees and pear trees are fairly easy to espalier because they have fruiting spurs along their branches. These fruiting spurs grow, grow close to the branches and fruit from year to year. So when you're pruning, look to preserve these swollen appearing fruit spurs because otherwise you won't get any fruit. Peaches and nectarines only produce fruit on new wood, which means that they're going to require a lot more pruning to encourage flushes of new growth, and they are best grown in a fan shape to provide room for the young new branches to form. Typically, peach trees should be pruned by February as they begin to bloom in early March. Wait just long enough the last of the spring frosts are over and then prune. Many types of stone fruit are tip fruiting, meaning that only the tips of the branches produce the fruit. This is the case with persimmons. With these, you'll need to have more offshoot branches to produce more tips that can bear fruit than you would with other varieties. Because the fruit is born near the ends of the branches on buds that began to form the previous year, you don't usually want to cut off the branch tips. And fig trees get very large. So although you can espalier them, you're going to have more work keeping them in check. You begin by deciding what kind of tree you wanna grow. This may be a little bit complicated as most fruit trees must be cross-pollinated, which requires at least one tree of a different variety located within 50 feet, as you see here. 
If you've got the room, you might not mind this. Not all of them are cross-pollinators. Look for self-pollinators like this nectarine, unless you're happy with training more than one espalier of the same variety in your garden. There are multi-budded fruit trees which are available. Each branch has a different variety growing on it. However, some limbs will grow more readily than others and you'll need to stay on top of pruning to ensure one variety doesn't overtake the rest. You can see a weaker limb on this tree. Note the branch on the lower left. It's much shorter than the others. And are the conditions right for the type of tree you wanna plant? Warmer climates may not have a cool enough winter for apples, as an example, while cooler climates may find it difficult to grow some forms of citrus. Check with your local master gardeners to find the best varieties for your area. A one-year-old tree is usually best to begin with as younger trees are easiest to train. They're more supple for one. Look for one about the diameter of your thumb. Examples of one-year-old trees are on the left. On the right is a nursery trained espalier, which is also an option. In midwinter, when you're picking out your one-year-old tree called a whip to start your espalier, you can usually pick the available whips up out of the soft mulching material they are displayed in at a nursery to check out the condition of the roots. Better ask first to be sure it's okay to lift up the whip at your particular nursery. Look for a good flare of the roots. You don't want to deal with a plant with roots growing mostly down and not out or with roots that are pot bound or girdling. In order to get a consistent fruit flavor and size, a cutting from a successful fruit tree is grafted onto the root stock from another tree. And in the case of espalier plants, you want that root stock to be from a dwarf variety. The upper part of the combined plant is called the scion, while the lower part is called the root stock. Make sure you leave the graft union exposed two to four inches above the soil. There are two labels on each whip you'll find in the nursery that note the variety and the rootstock. Here you see labels for a Fuji apple with an M111 rootstock, which is a semi-dwarf. You wanna make sure the rootstock is from a dwarf or a semi-dwarf variety when you're planning on espaliering your plant. Otherwise the plant will be too vigorous to keep within your chosen espalier style. If you're looking for self-pollinators, pear trees are self-pollinating so that you can get a good yield of fruit from just a single tree. You can plant just one pear tree and have it bear you fruit for years without having any other tree nearby for cross-pollination. However, there are several varieties of pear trees that are not self-pollinating. So check with your nursery before you buy. According to some experts, peach trees, most varieties anyway, are truly self-pollinating. And so long as you prune the tree beneficially, you'll be able to get a good yield of large edible fruit as opposed to small fruit. You want to remove excess fruit so that you'll have plenty of fruit, but it's not too crowded. Having fewer fruit generally produces larger fruit. Nectarines are similar to peaches and often substituted for them. They too pollinate on their own. Apricot trees are also a good choice for self-pollinating trees. Two exceptions are perfection and ryland varieties of apricots. These are not self-fruitful and will require cross-pollination. Check with your nursery before you buy. Location is key. Fruit trees are full sun dwellers and most are going to want sun year round, even if they go dormant in the winter months. You will need about eight feet of linear space in a well-drained spot that gets full sun. Full sun means the tree will receive at least six hours of light per day. A south-facing orientation is best 
South facing trees have the benefit of more sunlight during the winter months, enabling them to stay warm even if it gets cold out. Putting your tree against a wall will also help protect from chillier conditions, as mentioned earlier. Keep the trees six to 12 inches away from the walls. Avoid Western exposure for sensitive species like persimmons or cherries. And don't plant your espalier tree near large trees as their shade and roots could invade the space if too close. Depending on the type of espalier you're doing, you need to create a support mechanism and they vary. This one consists of redwood posts sunk in concrete with 12 gauge wire stretched between them. Use rot resistant wood, such as cypress, cedar, redwood, or pressure treated wood for the posts. Sink the four by four posts in concrete about 24 inches deep with the top of the concrete a bit above ground. Use heavy gauge wire, 12 to 14 gauge, and a screw and eye lag bolt at one end of your wire and a turnbuckle at the other end of your wire. Direct the shoot of your young tree along the wires strung between posts. Use flexible ties or jute to tie the young branches to the wires after the first summer. The young branches will grow faster if they are left to grow a bit upright. Um, when they're put horizontally along the wires, it slows them down, slows their growth down a bit. That's why you wait until the end of the first summer to actually tie them onto the wire. As you can see, the posts should be at least eight feet apart or more if that's the intent of your design. Plant the whip so the shoulders of the roots show at ground level and the graft sign is about three to four inches above soil level. Mulch well with compost make it about three inches deep and follow with a cover of wood chips. This diagram shows the basics of creating a cordon style design. In image one, you plant your dormant whip midwinter and cut it down to about 15 to 18 inches in height. That's about knee high. Leave at least three buds under your cut. These will become the first rungs of your cordon. Shown in image two, the first summer, you'll let those shoots and any others that happen to pop out grow and lengthen into small branches. Image number three now, at the end of summer into fall, choose the three best shoots that are evenly spaced around the whip and about an inch or so from each other. Cut off any of the other shoots, tie two of the shoots along the first wire and let the third shoot grow upward. Image number four shows the second winter dormancy after that first summer. <clears throat> Head the plant back to the second wire rung, again leaving three good buds below the cut to be trained next spring and summer. It takes at least four years to get an espalier with four rungs to it. You'll repeat steps two through four until you reach the number of rungs you're happy with. You will encourage fruiting spurs when you cut back each year's growth to three buds. The bottom image shows that the first year bud eventually turned into a fruiting spur. Once your espalier has reached the desired shape, most of the pruning can be done during spring and summer with some touch up in the winter. If you don't keep cutting back to three spurs on the current year's growth, you'll end up with vigorous shoots like these with very few fruiting spurs. Pruning should be done at least twice during the year, in early spring and summer, and possibly during the dormant season. Don't let it get away from you or you'll get a look like this. Notice on the right photo, there are only a few apples on the tree and they're 
quite a ways up, difficult to pick. Most of the branches are quite vertical with no fruit. Spring and summer pruning should be done to remove vigorous shoots and cut back to three buds, protecting any spurs. Slant your cuts towards the bud to let rain run off the cut surface. Cut so the top edge of the cut is above the bud and the bottom edge is level with the bud base. The photo on the right shows lots of fruiting spurs along the branch. Be sure not to cut these off. Fruiting spurs will look more swollen than foliage buds, which are a bit more pointed. To avoid summer burn, paint the exposed bark with a solution of white latex paint and water in equal quantities. Do this before any burning occurs. The tree can compartmentalize any burned areas, but it still damages the tree. You can see the results of summer pruning here on a cherry tree that's a few years old. And here it is again, a couple of years later. So to recap, plan your pattern. Espalier comes in all kinds of different varieties of patterns. Uh, fruit trees grow really well with the horizontal form, the cordon style. Or if space is at a premium, you can use a pattern where the branches are turned up as in this palmette verrier. If there's a long fence that needs to be covered, you might think about using the Belgian fence design. As far as location goes, any solid wall will do as long as there's enough light for the plant you want and room to plant. You can also use a container provided it's large enough to hold the plant when it's mature. When choosing your plants, remember the self-pollinators and also that apple and pear are probably the easiest to espalier. Then you'll need to prepare your support structure. Uh, some posts with wires running in between, uh, heavy gauge wire for 12 to 14 gauge. Plant the tree or shrub and the structure that will support it about a foot in front of a south facing wall, keeping the scion graft point three to four inches above the soil level. The first winter, cut the new whip to about 18 inches, leaving three buds. Let those buds grow that first summer. Train two of the small emerging buds along the wire with soft ties and let the third grow straight up. Cut off any extras. The second winter, when the trunk reaches the next wire up, allow two side shoots to develop and attach them to the wires. Let a third shoot grow upward to your next level. Cut off any extras. You will repeat this process until you reach the number of rungs you desire. Well, Janice and I hope that you got some new information out of this PowerPoint lecture. We certainly learned a lot from putting it all together. And I hope you've gotten enough to whet your appetite for going out there and planting your own espalier. And here we are <laughs> again. So I hope you got something out of that. <clears throat> um, we have a few questions here. Uh, are east facing walls okay? Um, yeah, east facing walls are gonna be okay. Um, you just wanna try and make sure that you get as much sun as possible on your plant. So check the space out during the day uh, and see how much sun you're getting on there. And if it's not much, like if there's other trees or shrubs that are shading it, then that's probably not a good location for you. They need at least six hours, I'd say, of good sun. <clears throat> also, for freestanding, is there a minimum height? Uh, not a minimum height. Um, you can plant these so that you've got a really low cordon style, you know, like a foot high. 
Um, or you can get it up to, you know, five feet high if you've got different rungs. You just want to make sure that you're not planting it, that you're not making the espalier so tall that it's hard for you to get fruit. That's the whole point of one of the points of doing the espalier is that it's much easier to, to harvest. So just keep that in mind. Let's see, what else do we have here? Are there any local examples to look at? Let me think, what have I seen? So, well, I know a couple of uh, places where they sell um, the bare roots uh, and usually have some espaliers. The Armstrong Gardens and um, Slope Gardens oftentimes will have an espalier or two in their location. And if you go to Harmony Farms, which is in Sebastopol and Petaluma, Harmony Farms sells the whips and they usually have a few espaliers there as well. Plants that have already been, been espalier, but they're a great location to go get the whips, and uh, which is the one year um, tree. And right now it's a really good time to do that because they're bare root. And you want to do your planting up for during the bare root. And you want to also cut it down to that 18 inch height during that bare root season to get started. Um, is the technique the same with plants like camellias? Yes, it is. You can do it the same way. Um, yeah, nursery recommendations. I would say that uh, for pre-trained, um, the only one I know of that specializes in pre-trained espalier is the, um, the ranch that was in Tennessee. I can't remember the name of it right now. I'll make sure that you get that. But um, they specialize in it, although they're not in California. Here, you can find some espaliers in most nurseries. You'll find just a few species of them here and there. Um, I know I've seen them at uh, Sloat before, and I've seen them at Armstrong before. Um, but I'd have to say that my favorite place is the Harmony Farms. They've got the best selection, I think, it, close to us at any rate, of the bare root that you can start with. Oh, you want to, we're going to send you a, um, the slides that have the different examples of fruit trees and um, which ones are easier to grow. Uh, we're going to send you a sheet of that. So that will take care of that. But I, I will go back to that slide and talk about those a little bit if you'd like. Um, <clears throat> oh, Filoli apparently has some good espaliers. Filoli that down in uh, Palo Alto area or Los Altos, those that area. That's a great garden to look around anyway. Um, uh, you can use espalier on, on really almost any tree that branches out. Uh, what you wanna look for though, is you're trying to keep the tree itself kind of small. So if you have a really vigorous, uh, variety of tree, like a fig, for example, it's going to be really hard to espalier it. That goes the same with shrubs. You can espalier shrubs to your heart's content. Uh, just make sure you're not getting a shrub that is generally a really huge plant, like gets to 25 feet tall. You will have a really hard time keeping it in size um, to fit your pattern. Uh, and anybody that wants to see this again, there is a recording of it. Um, through Larkspur Library and also on YouTube. So it's it's Larkspur Library's YouTube channel and they will have a copy of this so that you can take a look at it anytime you need to refresh. As well as in the follow-up email, we'll send the link to the recording too. Um, and I'm getting a little message here that says that there are good espaliers at the Santa Rosa Junior College farm. I'm trying to think if I've seen that before. I don't think I have, but that, okay. So that would be a great place to look. That's not too far away. <clears throat> um, okay, so anybody else have any questions? So there's some in the Q&A. So someone asked, does the support system have to remain indefinitely? Yeah, it does actually. Um, the support system is not really holding the plant up. It's just keeping the shape going of the plant. So, uh, I, I, you know, I've seen cordons or the Belgian fence style without the structure behind it, um, but it was many, many years old, like, you know, 50 maybe. So big, thick branches. So 
possibly at some point you can get rid of it, but you're always going to have to get in there every year and do a little bit of pruning. Otherwise you'll lose the shape and pattern that you've um, been training. So you're always having to get out there and prune, which is fun if you like to prune. Which So someone asks is how far apart should the horizontal wires be for cordon be? About 18 inches or so. That's also in a handout that we're going to send to you. Um, the one that showed the different uh, levels or, or the different steps, one, two, three, four, and five that you would take to start building a cordon style. Um, we're going to give you that uh, handout and it shows 18 inches between each one of the rungs and, and, and the first one being at about 18 inches high, which is about your knee, where your knee is. Um, uh, yeah, so you have to leave room for the branches to to have a little bit of space between one row and the next row up so that the bottom row gets sunshine. Otherwise the top row will shade that second row and you won't get as many uh, leaves and fruit and they'll get they'll weaken over time. Um, I have a question here regarding branch tips. Yeah, branch tips can be pruned for sure. Uh, it, it keeps at the very, very end of the branch like if you're on a cordon style like this, and at the very end, once it reaches the length that you want it, you're gonna be pruning that tip every year or so because you wanna keep it that, that length. The branches that are going up like this uh, each year, you're gonna to wanna to also cut those down during the winter and also spring and summer. You wanna bring those down so that you're getting only three buds showing of that, that year's growth. So you cut them down to those three buds and that will encourage more fruiting spurs. Some of those buds will turn into fruiting spurs that are down low and you wanna keep things down low. So the idea is you've got different rows of espalier. You wanna keep space between these. You don't want this row growing all the way up into this row and above because you'll shade too much of the greenery. So you just kind of keep them in shape. And the time to prune is early spring, midsummer, And then I usually prune during the winter as well. Not a lot, but some. Okay, so someone's asking when painting to prevent sunburn, do you just paint the main stock on the first tier of, of branches only or do you paint the branches also? Um, paint the branches also, anything that's gonna get a lot of sun. Now you won't need to do that every year because after a while the tree gets uh, big, strong, healthy bark and doesn't really need it as much. But when it's still young, the first two years, maybe two, three years, you wanna paint that, um, the front of the, just the part that's facing the sun, just the part that gets hit. And also the branches, just the part that gets hit with sun. And uh, this is a good point that somebody um, just put out here. Linda, thank you. Forgot about this, about mentioning this, that <clears throat> the ties that you use um, for the plant to, to tie the branches onto the wires, they need to be loosened every now and again. So if you tie with jute, sometimes those will just rot off, but you have to check them. Otherwise you'll get girdling where you're actually, you're actually squishing the, the branch with that wire because the branch is going to continue to get fatter and fatter and if you have a wire that's you know small you're going to squish it and it's going to girdle that branch and it'll affect how its growth so um you're out there anyway with playing with these plants fairly often because of the fact that you have to prune them so just check all the ties to make sure that none of them have gotten so tight that they're squishing and i usually use a flexible uh tie or you know twist ties that you get from a grocery bag you can use those those are great they work and they're free. Um, organic alternative to the latex paint. You know, I do not know about that. Um, an organic, oh yes I do. You can, you can wrap the, uh, the uh, tree trunk and any branches that are getting a lot of sun in burlap, which will degrade over time. Uh, instead of painting the tree, you can do that. And there's three more in the Q&A too. So um, could you please provide some technique on how to train Belgian fence? Oh. Um, I will try and include that in something that we send out. I don't have any 
um, slides on that right now. Uh, there's lots of information though on the internet if you want to take uh, a gander at that. Um, and that tree farm um, that's in Tennessee, they had just, they have a lot of images and information about training. So they're a good resource as well, just online. And that was, I can't remember the name of it. It was the, shoot. No, I don't even have it here. Anyway, I, do you remember what it was? It's River, River something. River Road Farms, that's it. River Road Farms in Tennessee. Um, the guy at Peter Therno is really, really nice. He's given me lots of information, uh, loves to talk about it. That's what he specializes in. He's been doing it for quite a long time, he and his wife. So they've got this farm there. And they, they send all over the United States. Uh, you just have to be really careful because California has certain requirements. Like we don't have really, really long, um, really, really cold winters. So some apple trees aren't going to work for us <clears throat> and some other plants. Um, let's see, what else have we got here? Is there another one from? Yeah, there's also any difference in feeding or irrigation for espalier. Feeding, okay. So this is how, now Janice is gonna have, give her two cents too on this one, but this is what I do when I'm planting. When I am planting, I have a very little bit of compost that I mix in with the soil that I'm planting with, but it's not very much. It's just a little bit. Um, so I plant uh, so that I've got twice the size, the, the hole has to be twice as wide as the roots, but I try and keep it narrow depth wise so that the top of the tree is, you can actually see that little flare of the roots coming out of the ground. I put um, compost about three inches thick around the tree. And I usually put a top layer of earth castings. I have found earth castings to be really great with, uh, with trees. And then I mulch on top of that with some um, wood chips. And I'll do that periodically, like maybe once a year, because I want to have this nice moist soil on the top of the ground to keep it, you know, not to keep it fairly well uh, moisturized, the soil. As far as uh, um, irrigation goes, I use inline emitters and I run them along both sides of the plant. I use the ones that are about I think they're 18 inches apart uh, and that either half gallon or one gallon, depending on if my soil is really full of clay, then I'll use the half gallon emitters. Or if I have some soil that's not quite as clay, then I'll use the one gallon. Um, so I'll run one of those along each side of the plant and then I water it maybe, depends on what the uh, temperature is doing. But during the summer, I'll water it maybe a couple times a week for 30 minutes, maybe once a week if it starts getting more into the fall. And then during the winter, I don't water them at all. Um, Harmony Farms sells an organic plant paint called IV Organics. One or four organic, Roman numeral four organics. I just got that from somebody. So Harmony Farms, that's a great place to go get these whips anyway. Um, good field trip. Uh, the last question is how tall should the tree grow? <laughs> oh, tall how tall? Grow. It's really how tall you want it to be. You can have it, you know, just stay a couple of feet tall if you wanted, uh, if you wanted to make a really low fence, or you can get up to five or six feet. Just remember, you want to be able to harvest the fruit if you're doing one for um, fruit purposes. If you're doing if you're doing a tree just for decor, like if you're trying to decorate the side of a building, you could go the whole height of the building. Uh, doesn't matter. Just whatever the variety of tree is meant to do, it will do. The only reason it stays small is because you're keeping it small. And that's just up to you. Um, I have a question here about if you've got a tree that's already a few years old, uh, can you espalier them? Yeah, you can actually. Um, I wouldn't get one, I wouldn't try and do it to one that's really established because you're gonna have trouble getting those branches to do what you want them to do. The tree's already taken care of that. But yes, I've done it before with a tree that was a couple of years old and had um, you know, a certain number of branches coming out. And then I just picked the ones that I wanted to go on the wire that were, and I, I created a, a my um, 
horizontal wires, you know, 18 inches apart and just got branches to go along it. But they were pretty young and I, uh, I try and do most of the training uh, when the branches are really young, so they're flexible. Um, it looks like there's one question about, um, and I guess in the slideshow it said something about exterior latex paint, but your slide said interior. Um, someone wanted to know. Interior or exterior, it doesn't matter. It's just white latex paint. Interior and exterior paint. You mix that 50-50. So you've got 50% of the paint and 50% water. So it's a pretty watered down version. And then you paint that on the tree. And I don't do that every summer. I just do that the first couple of years that, the, that I have that particular tree because they're still kind of young and the, the, uh, they haven't, their bark isn't, you know, hasn't gotten deep yet. Anything else? No, there's so far, there's no more questions, so. Janice, do you have anything? Well, here's no, one. I don't have anything to add, other than I really like the aesthetic aspect of espalying trees. And so for me, more than pro getting a product uh, or fruit, it's the beauty of the, the shape of the tree. It's a decoration. Yeah, and I have to say, I've got a, I don't have a very big um, garden like most people in this in our area. I'm in Nevada, and uh, I have five different fruit trees in my backyard and lots of other plants there because the five fruit trees don't take up very much room. I've got three of them along one wall and one of them along another wall, um, and they're just fun. You know, I get out there all the time, pruning them or looking at them. So, so one last question just come in. Um, if we have an established tree and there is more room on one side for growth, is it bad to have more growth on one side? No, you can, you can do it however you want. I mean, you might have a trunk that is growing really close to the corner of a house. And so you, don't, you can't put too many branches on that one side, but you can span them across the other side. That's okay. It, 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 you just have more pruning to do, that's all, because the tree's going to want to balance it out. So just keep you busy. Okay, nothing else? Okay, well, thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you, Dana and Janice for this great lecture. Um, everybody keep an eye out on your emails for the follow-up email that will have the links to the handouts, the recording and the Master Gardener survey. So, oh, and there's one more question popped up, I think. Oh no, it's just a thank you. So thank you all for joining us today and we'll see you next time. Well, thank you. I hope you got something out of this. <laughs> Bye, all. Bye. Bye.